Karanu. Daniel Karanu is the deputy director of Scripture Union. And at Scripture Union, they talk scripture, they communicate scripture. And you know yourself because you had some scriptures read somewhere. So you are a product of scripture. So you are in the right company this morning. And we want to give this opportunity to our brother. The morning he really blessed our hearts. And I know he's about to bless you this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. It's a pleasure to have you. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please greet me like this if you can see me. Thank you very much. It's a great joy and privilege to be here with you and among you to be able to bring the word of the Lord and uh, to talk a little about Scripture Union. As uh, Pastor Alice has said, my name is Daniel Carano and I love the Lord as my Savior and Lord. I am glad that He has saved me, He has forgiven my sins and that he is the one who is leading and guiding my life uh, so that as I walk with him, I have the certainty and assurance of living with him eternally. Praise the Lord. And that's the joy of my life, that he has known me and he has called me to walk with him. And uh, we have come, uh, I do bring greetings from uh, the director of Scripture Union and our staffs and my family. Please do receive them this morning. And, uh, Within the next few minutes, we will share the word of God, but allow me uh, in about uh, five or so minutes to say something very little about Scripture Union, because partly that's why we are here. Scripture Union works with churches. So we work with churches across the country, and indeed we are in more than 100 countries across the world. But we work with churches to do two things. One is to make God's good news known to people of all ages. So we come alongside the church to uh, ensure and to see that the gospel has been preached. And we are glad that we are here. We have been going to other churches and we have been in existence for over about you know, 49 years. We are celebrating 50 years next year. And, and that has been our journey. We've been resourcing the church and walking alongside the church to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached. But the second thing that we do is to encourage believers, Christians of all ages, children, young people, and adults to meet with God every day through His Word and through prayer. Praise the Lord. And that is significant, and we'll be sharing that a little, because we know that it is when believers meet with the Lord every day through his word and through prayer that they are able to grow they are able to develop their spiritual muscle and they are able to walk you know the journey of faith with confidence with hope and with faith uh, being able to face their challenges and um, uh, the journey ahead with victory and with courage and uh, we do that through four different uh, ministries we have four different expressions uh, in terms of carrying out those two things. One is that we have a ministry to children. We reach out to children uh, because we know that children are the foundation of any society. And if they are founded on the right things, then we know that the society will be stable and will be headed for the right direction. The Word of God uh, says in Proverbs 22 verse 6, that train up a child in the way he should go, and he will never depart from it even when he grows old. And in our own uh, uh, local communities, we have sayings that collaborate the wisdom of the scriptures. But what we do is we capture the children at primary school and we have a partnership with the Ministry of Education to go to all primary schools and help children know the word of God. So what we do, when we come to a primary school, we sometimes show Jesus film and the children who will get saved, we bring them together in what we call Bible clubs and help them to read and meditate the word of God so that they, their foundations can be right. And we encourage people because there are many primary schools. The official uh, government number is 22,000 uh, public primary schools. But if you add the private primary schools 
and uh, um, uh, other primary level education, they come to over 30,000 primary schools in this country. We all need to reach to these primary schools, and we encourage people uh, to join us, to join us so that we can be able to reach to these schools. So I will be asking some of you, if you hear the Lord you know, challenging you and speaking to you and encouraging you that you can be part of Scripture Union work, that you go and uh, we have a desk here, please sign in your name uh, in the visitor's book, uh, give us your telephone, give us your email, we will get back to you and uh, tell you how you can be able to participate because we need to reach children. Let me say this in, in a moment. There is a lot of evil that is targeted towards our children today. And some of you may be knowing this, and Pastor Al is allowing me to say this, you may be knowing that there is a very protracted and well thought out way of sexualizing our children. It is called comprehensive sexuality education. And I have not come to talk about that because I can talk about it because I'm part of an initiative that is trying to change the tide by engaging the government, the Ministry of Education, the Parliament, because through certain you know, UN bodies, there is a very strong push that children as young as age five, they are taught about one, choosing their gender, two, knowing that they can masturbate, and I can talk, and there are videos circulating, and it is real. We have documents in our possession that because there have been resistance at some levels of uh, Ministry of Education, they are going through county education offices. And Nairobi is one of the most targeted counties. And if you like, I can share with you a document that lays the strategy how to reach all the children. Let me say this. Because we must get angry about this and rise up as parents to protect our children. I'll tell you this. There are schools in this city where children go early in the school to have sex as practicals. Because they have been learning that and they go early to the school to have practice. When you see Project X, when you see 500 children in Eldred caught up having sex and drugs, some as young as age nine. When you see children in um, a bus in Kirinyaga having organs of sex and drug, it's a state-managed approach to make the society and Kenya know or feel that things are going out of hand. And then these bodies, because they have a curriculum, they have articulated very well, come and say, we have an intervention. They have the money. They have the curriculum. The curriculum teaches our children terrible, terrible, terrible things. So parents and Christians, we must rise up and say no to ungodliness. But let me ask you, how do you do it? I suggest God has given us children in our homes. If we don't start with the children in our homes, we will not talk about the children in the people. Praise the name of the Lord. And the first place to start is to know, have you given your child the right foundation? And I'll be saying that a little as I come to it. But we go to schools to help children know the word. Because Jesus said something very startling, very truthful, that heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will never pass away. Anyone who finds his foundation on the word of God has the certainty and surety of living eternally. And, and has the certainty that even when shocks and uh, storms come, they will still stand firm. What is we said? You and I have a responsibility to join hands to secure our children. Because children don't know the things that you do. They sometimes don't know the right thing. But you and I do know the right thing. One as person. So we reach out to children. We even reach out to children in Sunday schools. Because we recognize that our churches need a lot of support. 
to reach, you know, to do children ministry. There are many people who would like to do children ministry, but they don't have the skills, they don't have the materials. So we train Sunday school teachers in uh, all across churches. We publish materials like uh, these ones uh, uh, for Sunday school materials. Uh, we call it Evangeli, which uh, you know helps children uh, to read the Word of God. This is for age three to five, which has got a teacher's guide and a student activity book for ages uh, I think six to eight. Um, the same for ages 9 to 11 and for ages 12 uh, to 14 because we want the children to know the word of God. These clusters, I have told you, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 11, and 12 to 14, any child in that age group will be helped to go through the Bible once. So if a child at age 3 starts interacting with these materials, they will, by the time they reach age 14, they will have read through the Bible and interacted with the Bible content four times as if we sad. Because they are based on our, our, our curriculum, come to Jesus, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So that's a ministry to children. But we also reach out to families because we know families are under attack. There is a lot of challenges that our families are going through. And we run programs to support the family life, one targeted to the couples, that is called Enrich and Enjoy Your Marriage, and we organize uh, seminars and teaching uh, modules to help couples to reflect on their own life as couples and we can do that as a group at a group level at church level or at estate level uh, just to help you know uh, uh, couples you know and reach their marriage but the second one is targeted to parents where we do what we call positive parenting we recognize and you know that uh, most parents most parents don't know what to do with their children during holidays. Even at home. We have left the uh, parenting our children to television, to house helps, to uh, during holidays, we take our children to our show shows and bookers uh, so that they are brought. Some, most parents don't have time to interact with their children. They're strangers. And let me tell you something. You can tell me you do that, but we are in schools. Can I tell you? We are in 5,000 schools today. There are about 30,000. Uh, primary schools. We are in 5,000 as scripture unit. So we interact with children every day. We know what they tell us. Praise the name of the Lord. And it's not a time to drop the statistics here or the things that children tell us. But parents have neglected their children. And we must help parents know how do you bring children in a godly manner during this time. How do you sit down with your children and help them grow? So we have ministry to families. Um, we have ministry to help Christians. The third one is a ministry to help Christians read and interact with the Word of God. Because we came to learn and appreciate that believers really love to read the Word of God. And it's a very good thing. But most and majority of people don't know how do I read scriptures in a manner that is systematic and in a manner that is, you know, uh, 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 meaningful. And, and so what we have done over time is to be publishing, is to publish daily, uh, daily reading materials or Bible notes uh, to help people read the Word of God. Um, we, we publish materials like this, Daily Guide, uh, to help adults uh, read the Word of God. We, help, we publish a material like this called Daily Power to help young people in high schools, teens, to read the Word of God every day. We, we, we publish materials like this, God and Me, to help children in primary schools to read the Word of God because we want every person to meet with God every day through His Word and through prayer. Praise the Lord. All these books are available here. We, we, there are many other books. There are Bibles, books like Golden Bells. Uh, we publish them. This is our book. And to help you enrich your life. A story is told, and I need to be now going to scriptures, but a story is told of a person who really wanted to be reading God's word every day, you know, consistently. By the way, we say scripture union method of reading the word of God is there are four components. Reading the word of God every day, reading the word of God systematically, and reading the word of God thoughtfully, and reading the word of God prayerfully. So daily, systematically, thoughtfully, and prayerfully. So this person really wanted to read the word of God every day in a system. But he didn't have a systematic way of reading. So he would wake up every morning and pray to the Lord and tell the Lord, Lord, 
I want to read your word. And so where my eyes, when I open the Bible, where my eyes will land, that is where I know you want me to read the Bible. So he did that a few times. One day, he woke up, did the same, and where his eyes landed was Matthew chapter 27 and verse 5. Towards the end, the Bible says, and Judas went and hung himself. <laughs> so, he thought, the Lord cannot be telling me or giving me a message of hanging myself. So he closed the Bible and again prayed, Lord, I ask that you direct me to the right place and give me a right word for today. So he opened. Do you know the place he opened? It was Luke chapter 10 and verse 37. And it says, go and do likewise. <laughs> Here is this is difficult. So he got startled and woke up from the bed and went and knelt at the edge of his bed and really pleaded with the Lord. Please, Lord, give me a word for this morning. I don't want a message of death. So the next place he opened was John chapter 13, verse 27. It says, And what you are about to do, do it quickly. <laughs> That is the danger of reading the word of God haphazardly. And that's why we provide you with these materials. So that you do not become like this man who is getting a consistent message of death from the scriptures. And you know, people have justified a lot of things from scriptures. So let's not be part of man, one as we said. And of course the fourth thing we do is that we, we have Christian literature that we sell partly as part of ministry to help believers access good literature, good Christian literature, but also as a way of supporting ministry. So I will want to welcome you that as you move out, please think about how can we partner together. And please sign in, give us your name, your number, and your, your email if you have, and we will get back to you this coming week. But for now, I want us to move on with looking at the Word of God and we will carry on with the theme of the place of God's word in a believer's life. The place of God's word in a believer's life. And to do this, I want to read two passages of scripture which we will use for our reflection. One is in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verse 1 to 9. And the other one is the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 1 to 30. And we will read those two passages back to back. Let's pray as we read the scriptures. We come to you, our Heavenly Father, this morning, fasting and hungry, that you may feed us, that you may quench us. Let your Spirit speak to us. Let your Spirit open up the truth of your word. So that as we receive it, oh dear Father, it will build us up in, the, in our most holy faith. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to these people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I saw to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. 
Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. O Lord, your God is with you wherever you go. Praise the Lord. We turn to Luke chapter 4, verse 1 to 13 says this. Then, Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this school to become bread. But, when, but Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I'll give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whoever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only, you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Praise the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. Now, we've read two passages. And we start with Joshua. And a time has come when the children of Israel are about to enter the promised land. They have, they left Egypt in Exodus. God took them through a very long route to test their hearts whether they will be obedient to him. And most of them proved to be disobedient and rebellious. So all those who were 20 years and above died in the wilderness, except two people, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb uh, the son of Jephthah. And so time has come, Moses has been tasked with the Lord to restate the law to the children of Israel, because by the time they left Egypt, the people who are now about to cross into Jordan, they left Egypt when they were 20 years and below, and God would not term them, would not consider them as mature enough to have considered the deliverance of the Lord and the acts of the Lord that he showed to his people as he delivered them out of Egypt. They were considered as children and so they were not, they could not take responsibility of not knowing. But now God has tasked Moses to restate the law to them and Moses has done that throughout the book of Deuteronomy. And now it's time to pray. But what has happened is that by the time Moses finishes to do that, because of the hardness of people's heart, Moses has even sinned against God, and God has made a promise to Moses, you will not enter the land. But your, uh, your servant Joshua will do that. And, and for whatever reasons, Moses did not enter the promised land. So God, you know, Moses dies, is buried by God, and Josh, God comes and tells Joshua, hey, rise up, man. It's you who is going to take these children into the promised land. And so... Joshua, as Moses' servant, 
has had time to examine and watch and observe and interact with the ministry of Moses to see how Moses carried out the work. Certainly, Joshua had come to recognize that leading people was a very difficult thing. Probably he even came to understand that the reason that Moses did not enter the land was because he did wrong things arising from leading the people, you know, being provoked by people to anger. Joshua had observed the struggles of leadership that Moses experienced, and he had the ability or the uh, justification to be afraid. So God comes and tells Joshua two things. Certainly, you're the one who will lead him, but I want you to do two things. One, be strong and courageous. I don't want you to be afraid. Praise the name of the Lord. And if you count, if you read back and see how many times God has told Joshua, either be strong and courageous or do not be afraid. A reassurance from God that I'm the one who is sending you. Don't worry about the difficulties. Don't worry about the challenges you will experience. Don't worry about, you know, the, the, the challenges of leadership. I'm the one who, in fact, at some point told me, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Am I not the one who has commanded you? Why not you So, uh, that's one of the things. Be strong and courageous. And brothers and sisters, many times, and from time to time, the Lord will entrust responsibility to us. The Lord will call us to fulfill certain duties and tasks, whether at church, whether at home, whether in the society, whether at workplace, the Lord will always avail from time to time opportunities for us to be able to stand for him and execute work on his behalf. I think uh, I've seen, uh, we have been invited, we have been given the, the theme of the month of June, isn't it? It's taking Christ to the marketplace, isn't it? So, so that's a task that we already have been given. And sometimes our marketplace, our workplace, may not be always friendly and conducive to talk about Jesus. But he has given us a task. So he says, do not be afraid. Be courageous, be strong, because I'm the one who has given you that task. So let us embrace the roles and responsibilities that God gives us with courage and strength and confidence because it's the Lord who has given them to us. We missed an opportunity of shouting, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and someone said, and this is in the public domain, that whenever God gives you a responsibility, He also gives you the response ability, the ability to respond to tasks that He has given. And, and so let us be strong, let's be courageous, let's take up that which God gives us, just as he told Joshua. The second thing he asked Joshua to do is in verse 7 and verse 8. And verse 8 picks it very well. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to observe and do all that is written in it. When you do that, two things will happen. One, you will be prosperous, and two, you will be successful. Praise the Lord. That's beautiful. You know, God tells Joshua, I want you to be prosperous. I want you to be successful. God gives Joshua a formula for prosperity and a formula for success. The formula for prosperity and success is in meditating on the book of the law. It's on meditating on the word of God. Hallelujah. Maybe you don't see sense in it. You're asking, hey, Karanu, are you telling me that I spend the whole day Monday to Sunday just meditating? What about going to work? What about investing? What about you know, my employment? What about the Bible says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. So that you may be careful to observe all that is written in it. Praise the name of the Lord. And we will need to, you know, discuss and see what that means. You know, we wake up every day 
we, we exert ourselves to the work that we do because we seek prosperity and we seek success. We invest a lot. We deny ourselves a lot because we seek prosperity. We want to live well. We want to live right. We want to enjoy life. The Bible says the secret of prosperity and success is not how much you do. It lies in this word. Praise the Lord. You know, there is a person, Pastor Alice, please allow me to say, I know this is a church service, and these are believers who do not listen to certain songs. But allow us to give an answer to a person who asked a question some time ago through a song from my community. He was asking, what can I do? Those of you, I don't think you people know this. He said, what can I do so that trouble can get out of me? I'm trying to translate. I rise up very early in the morning. And she died. He told her, I'm going to get out of me. I'm going to get out of that's a song that you should not listen to. <laughs> we want to provide an answer to that person. You know, rising up early and returning late is not what will give you prosperity. In fact, to the confession of that person, he says, trouble and problems and poverty is still abides with. Can we provide an answer to that person? It is in the world. The, pros the formula for prosperity and success is in the word of God. Because it is in this word that as we read it, you tell me, do not be lazy. Go to the ant or slugger. Consider its ways and be wise. You know, the word of God will not tell you to sit down and just relax and wait for manna from heaven. It will tell you to work, but it will tell you how to work. It will create the ethics for work. It will tell you God hates laziness. He hates foolishness. He, ha he hates all these things. And it will push you to do the things that God requires, but do them within the framework of God's word. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. So the word of God, when we meditate on it, it's not part of laziness. In fact, one cannot meditate on God's word and become lazy. If one meditates, because the first thing we interact with when we open the word of God is God working. Praise the Lord. God is working. It's the first thing that we interact with. So anyone who reads scriptures starts to appreciate that God works. But when he works, he also rests. Praise the Lord. So, so God creates the framework and he requires us to meditate on it. Now, move, move forward to Psalm chapter 1. Because you may think that this word, you know, it was just meant for Joshua. Uh, the psalm is David and these are so many years later comes and says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of wicked, or stand on the path of sinners, or sit on the seat of the mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. So he's like a tree planted by the waterside, which brings forth its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Let me say something powerful. Whatever he does, prospers. What else we say? Whatever he does, prospers. He says the wicked are not so. The wicked are not so. But whatever this man who delights in the law of the Lord, who meditates on it day and night, whatever that man does, prospers. Whatever you lay your hands on, prospers. Because the blessing of the Lord is upon whatever you do. Because you have first honored. Jesus challenged his disciples. Those who decided to follow him. And it is us today who are following Jesus. He challenged them in Matthew chapter 6. He asked them, why do you trouble yourself by what you will eat, by what you will drink, by what you will wear, and even we can say by where you will stay. You know, Jesus is a sociologist. He knows the basic necessities for mankind is food, shelter, 
clothing. If you have those, you know, he knows we need that. In fact, he knows it because before he created man, he knew man will need all those. So he first prepared a garden, and then he prepared food. So when he brings man, he had already created a shelter, and there was plenty of food that he gives man. You are free to eat every tree in this garden. Praise the Lord. So God knows we need that. And you know, he's the one who designed it even before he created man. Therefore, he, he asked his disciples, why do you become anxious? Why do you run after these things? And he challenged them, don't run after these things, because these things are the same things that pagans, and he uses a very strong word, pagans run after. Praise the Lord. So he gives them two illustrations. He tells them, hey, go and look at the birds of the air. Go and look at the birds of the air. Birds of the air, they don't gather, they don't store, but none of them has ever fallen down because they are hungry. Let me ask you, as I asked the first time, have you ever come across a bird carrying a jembe that is going to the farm to feed? Have you ever come across a bird building a barn? Barn is what it is. A store, store place. Have you ever? Never. Have you ever come across a bird that has fallen down and died because of hunger? No. Ask the Kenya Wilder Service, they will tell you no. So God says, you are more important than birds. Praise the Lord. He feeds the birds of the air. He knows where food for them, they don't go to the shamba. They don't store, but none of them has ever died because of lack of food. He feeds them. Our Heavenly Father feeds them. So that's one illustration he says. Then the second one, I think he quite really addresses it to the ladies. Kind of sorts asks them, why do you go to Salon? Why do you go to boutiques? He says, consider the ladies of the field and see their beauty. None of them goes to the sun. <laughs> None of them goes to the sun. But even Solomon, with his entire wisdom and beauty, that even Queen from Ethiopia could go to Israel to visit Solomon, could never come close to the beauty of the leaves. Because God covers them with beauty. Praise the Lord. So Jesus asks his people, why do you follow after those things? Why? So he tells them in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added Seek the kingdom of God first. My brothers and sisters, this might appear like it's a joke. It might appear like it's, you know, Paul says the things of God look foolish to the people of this world. But they are wisdom and righteousness to those who believe. What is first answer? So when Christ, when God tells Joshua, Prosperity lies, prosperity and success lies in the manner in which you will meditate on God's word. When the psalmist says that, when, you know, Jesus says the same, then it is or he is a wise person who pays attention to that truth of the scripture and starts to take seriously the word of God, to read the word of God every day, not as a by the way, not as a lullaby. You know there are people who are what me potelewa na usigizi diyo wanachukua Bible wanaanza kumsoma. And then they come and give a testimony here that as I read the Bible, the Bible was very soothing. I didn't even know when I slept. Because it's a lullaby. 
use it as an alibi. There are people who the best time they find to read the Bible is when they are in jail. They cannot afford God any other time. They afford God time when they are in jail. So you can see where we are relegating God. He's not a priority. But can you think about how much you think about the food that you eat? Who came here without eating? Unless you are fasting. And then if you are fasting, don't play. Please, you So you have to do it in secret. <laughs> who will not who will not eat by about time? Some of you have plans to take your families to go and have huge bites. <laughs> Some. And you will spend a lot of money. You spend two thousand, three thousand, five thousand because it's a family. Out food. Some of us buy food for the whole month. We keep it in stock. We have freezers, we have stores, we keep food, we go to other places and buy Miji and other things in the store. Food security. <laughs> <laughs> but how many of us store this word in our hearts? With the same vigor, with the same energy, with the same passion, with the same priority. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 6, Let the word of Christ dwell in your heart richly. Praise the Lord. What's the word of God that is in your heart? To what extent, if your heart is opened up and measured, has it, you know, stored the word of God? I was telling the express service, there is a question, parents listen to me, there is a question, a constant question that we ask our children every evening during school Time. Every year. Which one is it? Have you done your home? It's a song. It's a chorus. It's known. And if any parent comes and finds their child, they have not done homework. No child is happy. You can even spam that child and tell the child, What are you going to find? Once a man is an idiot? How many parents ask their children on a daily basis, consistently, with the same passion, Have you read your Bible today? How many? What are we modeling to our children? You know, we communicate value by the things we speak, but also by the things we don't speak. When we show children that homework and education is more important than the word of God, we are communicating that education is more important than God. We are telling them that education and homework is more important and must take the first priority and not God. Jesus says this, whoever comes after me and loves his brother or mother or child before me is not worthy of me. And we must as parents, we must as parents rethink our priorities. And we must, with the same vigor and passion and consistency, Ask our children, have you read the Bible today? Have you read the Word of God? And not just leave it to them. Parents normally help their children to do homework. Can you help your children to read the Bible? Can you walk with them? Can you buy God and me for your child in primary school? Or for your grandchild who is in primary school? Can you buy daily, daily power for your teen who is in high school? Can you buy daily guide? For your child who is in university. Because you have a responsibility as a parent to bring up children in a godly way. At whatever point. And there is no time the role of a parent becomes obsolete. Whether your children are old or whether your children are young. We must model. Without, but how can we tell children to read the word of God if they are not seeing it in us? If it is not a priority, we are not modeling it. So it must begin with you as a parent. What else we say? The word of God. Peter says this. Through Christ, who is the word of God, we have everything that we need for this life and for God in us. Praise the name of the Lord. In the interest of time, Let's look briefly at the passage in Luke. Because God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not be far from you, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and you shall be careful to observe all that is written. 
And you know, as Christians, and in our journey, in our Christian journey, we encounter challenges, temptations, and trials all the time. And that is why God is telling Joshua, if you want success, success in life, whenever you have hindrances and setbacks and temptations and trials, the only way to help you overcome that is the word of God, is the law of the Lord. So we look at an example of Jesus who faced the trial of, of the day, a huge setback to his ministry. How did he overcome? And as we read through, Jesus faced three temptations, and we know them, we have recited them, we know them very much. And after spending 40 days and nights in the wilderness, at the, you know, before he inaugurates his ministry, he's hungry, sadly, the scripture says so. So the devil comes and he knows. There are two things that the devil knows. One, the devil knows Jesus is the son of God. Praise the Lord. You know, he was in heaven, so he knows. He was thrown from heaven. He knows who Jesus is. By the way, if you read the book of Mark, that comes out very strongly because whenever Jesus will encounter a person who is demon possessed, Jesus would not speak a word. It is the person who would come running to Jesus and ask, the son of Most High, what do we have to do with you? Praise the Lord. They would fast. They are the ones who would bleed for man because they know who Jesus is. But the second thing that the devil knew for certain is that Jesus is hungry. Okay, those two things were in the public domain as far as the devil is concerned. So he comes and if you are the son of God, of course that's tempting. Because he already knows he's the son of God. If you're the son of God, turn this stone into bread. And of course, when you are hungry, son, you want to grab anything that is uh, available so that you fast when you are hungry, isn't it? A snack so that you wait for the main food meal. Jesus had the ability to turn the stone into bread. Hey, he had. Don't you believe he had? He had. But Jesus saw through that deception. And do you know how Jesus overcame? How did he overcome? It is written. Actually, that's that's a secret. Please write that 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 phrase down. It is written. Praise the Lord. It is. Jesus referred to the word of God to counter the temptation of Satan. It is written. Three times Jesus says it is written. No, two times he says it is written. The last time he says it has also been said. Now, Jesus was tempted by food. The temptation that the devil brought to Jesus was about food. Flashback to Adam at the garden of Eden. And the devil, the same devil came to Adam and Eve and tempted them through food. Eat. What Adam failed to do was to remember what God had said. God had told him, don't eat everything, but don't eat this food. The devil comes and tells him, eat this food. So the most prudent thing for Adam to say is to ask, what did God say? What God? What has God said? God has said, I should not eat this. And so he should have told him, you shall, you know, it is said, God said, I will not eat this. But Adam forgot the word of God. And when he forgot, he brought all the troubles that we have today. Blame it on Adam. <laughs> but blame it also on you and me. <laughs> because we have the Adamic picture. Let me tell you, but Jesus overcame. Let me, the first level of temptation that we all experience is on food. It's on food. Adam was tempted on food. Jesus was tempted on food. One of them overcame because he had the word of God. Praise the Lord. And you know, food is a metaphor for all sensualities, all the things that demand the appetite, you know, immediate fulfillment. In the food, Sex, fashion, and all those things. Fame, you can name them. But success lies in knowing what is written. The work of God. It's what happened. The second level of temptation when Jesus overcame the temptation of food was about power and fame and authority. 
But you're fighting even in our country because of power and faith. We know where we are coming from. You have had, not in Deliverance Church International, but you have heard of churches where people fight because of power. Who will be the chairman? Who will be the senior pastor like that? Have you not heard? People fight for power in our homes. Husband and wives tussle a lot about power. Who will have the final say? When you find the homes dysfunctional, there is a power play in our homes. Power is the second level of temptation. Jesus overcame that by referring to the word of God. It is written. Praise the name of God. It is written. Then something interesting happened. The devil realized that Jesus is overcoming him because of reference to scriptures. And showing that that temptation, the devil engaged a different gear of reference to the scriptures. So he tells him, hey, takes him to the highest pinnacle, part of the uh, temple. Tells him, throw yourself down. Because the devil says what? Because it is written. Hey, brothers and sisters, the devil knows the scriptures. He knows. In fact, I think it's James who even says, he knows that God is there and he even does more. He trembles. He shudders. So the devil knows scripture. So he comes and quotes scriptures to Jesus. Let me ask you. If, the, if Satan comes quoting scriptures to you, because he's a very good preacher, quotes, if he comes quoting scriptures to you, will you be able to know? Because it's for sure. He quoted Psalm 91. Is it Psalm 91 or Psalm 90, Psalm 91? And, and another Psalm. If the devil comes quoting scriptures to you, will you find out? Will you be able to discern that this is not God? This is the voice of the devil. Even if it is an appearance of scriptures. You know, the challenge, the call that is being placed on us this morning is not just to read this word as a novel. It's not just to read this word for personal convenience. But it is to interact with this word because this is the mind of God. Oh, yes. What a And he says that he has exalted his word above his name. Praise the Lord. This is the mind of God. If we want to know the mind of God, we want to know how he speaks. We want to know how he is like. We want to know his thoughts. Then we must anchor ourselves and immerse ourselves deeply, intentionally on this word. So Jesus... When the devil tempts him like that, Jesus tells him, it, it is also said. You know, elsewhere it is said. So, so, so Jesus was not just fast with Deuteronomy chapter 8. Praise the name of the Lord. He knew the entire scripture. And he confronted Satan with the word. So the challenge this morning is, what is your pattern and behavior in terms of reading God? What place do you give scriptures in your life on a daily basis? Do you do all things and then remember that you have to read the Bible? So you give God the last end of your energy? Or is reading of the word of God a priority and a passion in your life? Let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord convince you. Let the Lord move you to action. Because it is him who desires that you get to know his word. I end with this illustration. Do you know your bishop? Do you know your bishop? Bishop Dr. Kimani? Do you know him? Do you know how he speaks? Do you know his voice? Sure? Clear it? Thank you. If we have a war, Around this church, a very long, 30 meters above, and we are here. You know he's not in church, so I know Pastor Alice will tell you, will tell you. we talked about it. So he comes and hides behind there because maybe he wants to hear, what is this preacher called Karam say? Then, after, <laughs> if he hears a good word, he shouts, Amen! You know, and you are not expecting 
Would you know that that is Bishop Kimani? Yes. You would know. Yes. Why? You know the book. You have interacted with him. You know his voice, isn't it? You have heard him and heard him and heard him and heard him and heard him again and again. So that your ear is able to do something called discrimination. You are able to pick his voice in the midst of so many voices or in the midst of if you cannot see him, you can still be able to pick his voice out, right? Now that, but none of you can be able to pick my voice. Because my voice is a stranger to you. It's the first time you're hearing. But you can be able to pick the voice of your bishop. That's what God wants us to be with. That we have heard him and heard him and heard him and heard him and heard him that we are able to pick his voice in the midst of many voices that are going round in his nation. Because there are so many voices. But the only person who will be able to do that is the person who hears him every day through his word. Sitting down to commune with him through his word. May we rise. Now, you know yourself. And you know whether the Lord is speaking to you or whether he is not. If he is speaking to you, I ask you to take a moment. Probably loudly or in quietness, just to respond to him. And tell him, Lord, I can no longer hide from you. It is enough. Forgive me for putting you in the periphery, pursuing my own things and prioritizing my own businesses and work and not giving you the position, the, the first priority in my life. And he is faithful. But make a commitment that you will be able to work with him. You will prioritize and become passionate about reading his word. Father in heaven, we are before you this day. And our lives are not hidden from you. But you know us. You know our behavior, and, and Lord, we cannot hide from you. So this morning, we come to you in humility and brokenness. And we ask in the name of Jesus that you give us where we have put you in the second or third or fourth place, oh dear Lord. But we want to prioritize you in, you, in our lives, oh God. We know you have given us your word so that your word can communicate to us your mind, oh God. We pray in the name of the Lord that, Father, we will find the joy, we will find the thirst, we will get the hunger, oh God, of reading your word. So help us. Help us, Lord. Help us to honor you with our time. Help us to honor you with our lives. Help us to model a life of godliness and a life that is immersed in scriptures, both to ourselves and to our families and to our children especially, because this is our prayer in Jesus' name.